Uh, so Voice in the Silence uh, is, an, is an exhibition project that uh, addressing issues of gender equality in home, in the legislative level and in professional sphere, a uh, particular uh, field of art. And the project uh, responds to the current conservative turn uh, that has implied the patriarchal system in many so so societies today. So it was also our reaction to the, um, uh, to the uh, events uh, when uh, during the uh, beginning, in the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, it was a active uh, female movements uh, which uh, were fighting on the different levels on their rights and trying to identify uh, their rights and equality within society. So lots of things being done while today we still, um, almost one century ago, we still um, uh, um, witnessing this uh, conservative turn, uh, turn in society, which is uh, limiting female rights. And um, such events like uh, discrimination of domestic violence in Russia or Turkish, uh, Turkish Istanbul Convention exit, the new laws uh, restricting abortion uh, in the US and Poland, all of these are uh, very much uh, putting down uh, women's existing uh, econ uh, and putting uh, economic vulnerability and uh, unequal pay uh, and labor conditions in most countries and uh, demonstrates how government, governmental systems uh, systematically deny women's uh, their basic rights and agency and uh, protection. So maybe these processes are not always um, uh, in some societies, especially that are practicing uh, uh, freedom and uh, societal rights and uh, human rights, maybe such uh, processes are not uh, very obviously uh, noticeable, but they are somehow very, um, uh, they are uh, incorporated in uh, everyday situations. And sometimes uh, everyday violence is becoming a normality. And, uh, but nevertheless, it's, um, um, uh, it's very important to speak about and very important not to agree with. So therefore the, um, uh, the format of uh, the, the title of the exhibition and the necessity to raise your voice to speak about is a uh, putting of um, uh, importance and um, uh, questions also what is happening if we don't speak and uh, and uh, if we not agree uh, if we're not uh, speaking up and raising our voice yeah <clears throat> thank you Anya about the sum up of the show um, just you know Mm, I think we we talked about it also the last time when we had our curatorial tour online that um, in the show what kind of struck us was the universality of so many female experiences across the globe and um, kind of knowing that and understanding that in our research we wanted to um, present examples from different geographies and uh, different time contexts and at the time when we were plotting the show I was based in Tel Aviv and uh, Israeli society is, of course, also very diverse, and there are, you know, Jewish women and Palestinian women, and um, um, female, um, uh, um, you know, lab labor migrants who come from the Philippines, and lots of women with the Russian background. So there are lots of women with different agenda who also try, I think, to to find their place in the society, and then also often look for. Um, for support and for protection of their rights. Um, and um, I was very curious whether there are any institutions or groups or organizations that deal with female rights uh, in Israel uh, and Palestine. And then I um, came across Haifa Feminist Institute, which I find an extremely unique um, and very powerful institution that's been uh, there uh, since the 70s and which um, sees as its mission to um, gather information about um, feminist 
movements, organizations, groups of people that were um, kind of struggling and fighting for enhancing the feminist agenda um, in the country, and also uh, trying to create and protect rights of other women. Um, and this group of volunteers created an absolutely uh, unique archive um, that um, has lots of emphasis on uh, um, rights and positions of Arabic women on LGBTQ communities. Um, and um, you know, being super fascinated with this um, um, place, I was thinking who could be an interesting artist to, to work with this collection. And then I thought of a free and knowing her practice and her um, approach to archives and also how she voices archives by um, you know creating this reading sessions and um, organizing orchestrated readings. I thought that maybe she could be um, an artist who will um, very delicately could um, work with, with the themes that are raised, uh, raised and stored and very meticulously documented what the archive. Um, and of course, it was very important for us to also have a voice representing the archive. That's why we have um, uh, Jessica today. Jessica Nevo uh, is, um, is um, <clears throat> a sociologist um, and um, uh, activist, and she is an expert on gender and conflict transformations. And she's been working for years um, in the nonprofit sector and civil society as a consultant and external evaluator. And uh, she's also an independent researcher on transitional justice. And I hope she will speak a little bit more about um, this term in particular. So she's the co-founder of uh, Justice in Case. It's the Center for Alternative Justice. And she's very actively involved in development of people's courts and civil truth commissions on gender-based violence in Israel, Palestine. Uh, and Ofri, who I uh, very briefly introduced in the beginning, I want to come back to her. She, is, um, she was born in Haifa and she's an artist and a PhD candidate at the School of Visual Arts in Hamburg. And her work concerns the composition, activation and dissolution of private scholarly and independent archives. And her manner of working is based often on um, site-specific and collaborative practices, which often provide her the basis for installation of objects, photographs, and videos. And additionally, she develops a series of orchestrated lecture performances. Um, they combine oral narratives, field recordings, and objects and function, both within academic conference settings and in exhibition spaces. Um, so here are uh, two speakers uh, today. We're super pleased to, to have you both. Um, with us in this final event of the exhibition. Uh, so free, I'm giving uh, the floor, passing the floor to you. Thank you very much, Maria. Can you hear me well? Um, yes, so as Maria already kind of introduced me and um, I see that also Hannah Safran is in the audience uh, from the Feminist Institute in Haifa. Um, I was invited to take part in the exhibition a long time ago in 2019. Uh, as Corona happened and other uh, occurrences, I wasn't able to proceed with the research in the archive of the Feminist Institute in Haifa as I imagined to do. But the initial att attempt was to go through uh, documents there and to create um, a project. And what came about is the idea to create also a reading session that will be based on all uh, documents from the archive. Um, since this didn't, didn't transpire, I uh, initiated this event to speak with people from the Feminist Institute itself and to speak about the work that they've been doing. And my decision was to um, use this opportunity and to reflect on some notion that I was from uh, my engagement with some documents I have already been look looking at from the archive. Uh, specifically, these are protocols which were written in the 1990s as part of courtroom observations uh, project, which was um, conducted by volunteer members of several feminist organizations from Haifa. 
This is based on an American model of women going into the courtroom and um, observing uh, trials of domestic violence, writing in their own words what is happening for in the trial in order to also document, support, give assistance to the women, to the victims, as well as uh, to study the happenings uh, in the courtroom for further evaluation and, and examination and maybe activism act upon it. Um, my perspective on this document uh, is slightly hesitant. As I uh, read the documents, I felt like I couldn't deal with them in the manner I have been working with. Uh, I worked a lot with transcribed oral narratives before and I felt like I couldn't handle them in the same, same manner because of the um, difficulty to approach uh, uh, like the almost like private words and although taking place in a in public realm, which is the courtroom, it was still seems to me very, very private. So what I have done is started to reflect on this and created a small uh, reading that is based on several things, partly from my own diary, just from looking at the documents, secondly from um, a book by uh, Maggie Nelson, which is called The Red Part, and was also a documentation uh, of her um, witness of a trial of her own um, family member, and other all kinds of scholarly references. Um, I'm giving you an example of the reading because uh, it cannot be, we decided to condense it and it's not going to be the entire project, but it's just a, like a, a fragmented, um, fragmented part of it. So it's a little bit all over the place because it's supposed to be longer, but um, uh, you'll bear with me. Um, I'm going to read now. Uh, archival proximities from the house through the archive to the courtroom and back. My first visit to Haifa Feminist Institute led me to a residential building. I'm almost confused by the appearance of it, expecting to enter an official municipal building rather than through the back stairs of an old multi-story house. Here I meet with the historian Hannah Safran and get sense of the bustling atmosphere of women in action. The archive itself contains the work of the activist organization for the last decades and is elegantly placed behind a red velvety curtain, almost like a stage or rather a large precious chest. A long conversation illuminates the massive and crucial work these women engage with over the last few decades. A sense of urgency is evident in every word that is being said. The archive is at risk of disillusion if they were ever to stop the work. On the second occasion, I'm able to visit the archive. I hastily opened the boxes. I have not so much time worrying I won't be able to make it soon again. I hurry to snap as many photos of documents as I can in order to be able to examine them later on. It is only within the one kilometer radius distance limitation from my home, as required by the state corona related restrictions at the sheltered yet secluded surrounding of my mother's house that I am able to finally read through the documents I hastily made, it, made copies of. The privacy of the archive juxtaposed against the privacy of my home. Domesticism here is coupled with the archive on more than one level. The archive is housed in an apartment building. The women running it voluntarily extend their work within a community through the work of the archive. A Chile member wrote that the status and the power of the archive derive from the disentanglement of building and documents. Although he probably had very different archive in mind, an archive whose austerity gives the place something of the nature of a temple or a cemetery, as he writes. Here, the archive also derives from its architecture and from the proximity to the neighborhood itself. Through the bleak light of the screen, the images of the documents mirror my image. 
at the privacy of my home, the voyeuristic case of the researcher is becoming more pronounced. Here, I cannot assume a professional distance. I am closely viewing the materials enabled by the very same technology with which I share many other intimate activities. I'm struck by the words that I'm reading. The documents I then so easily snapped were handed to me by the archivist. You should look at this, she said, after hearing about the concept of the exhibition I should take part in. Voice in the Silence, which deals with the convoluted relationship of justice, domestic violence, and the law. The thick folder, folders contain stacks of ruled paper filled with handwritten notes. These were personal observations formulated by women's coalition of several feminist activist organizations who volunteered to bear witness to trials of domestic violence in order to advocate for better condition for women within the legislative system. It is a strange experience to be studying these very private yet persistent words of others, which are made public in the courtroom. The reports expand over the years 1991 to 1995 and cover more than 200 court hearings which took place in Haifa, Akko and the area, in both Hebrew and Arabic. The objective of observations, as stated by the final report, are to collect information about how the legal procedure in Israel is affected by social perceptions, beginning with the very formulation of the law through the manner of investigation and self-expressions of the judges. The volunteers were instructed to report not only about what was actually said during the trial, but also about how it was said to capture the tonality of speaking to describe the conditions in the room where words were uttered into the void. This observation, like the formal court, unlike the formal court protocols, includes subjective impressions of the observer which transgress the severity of the bureaucratic tone. They document empathy and acu acuteness, awareness that undermines the common perception of, perception of justice. They override the rigid opacnesses of the official court protocols. They tell the same story yet so vulnerably. Now, these delicate things were part of my possession, layers of lies perforated at one side and stacked into seemingly unknown order. In her book, The Red Part, Maggie Nelson tells the story of the belated trial of the murderer of her aunt, Jane Mixer, an aunt who she had never met. met. The trial took place 35 years after her death. The book is both a novel and an account of the ambivalence of justice, turning over the notion of justice on every side like a piece of meat on a pan. She writes, I find the grammar of justice maddening. It's always rendered, served, or done. It always swoops down from high, from God, from the state, like a bolt of lightning a flaming sword coming to separate the righteous from the wicked in earth's final hour. It is not apparently something we can give to one another, something we can make happen, something we can create together down here in the muck. The problem may also lie in the world itself as for millennia justice was, has meant both retribution and equality, as if a gaping a chasm didn't, did not separate the two. Reading through the protocol of numerous violence act, the notion of justice is becoming even more scorched. The idea slowly unfolding was to create an online Zoom reading session that will connect all these multiple spaces of private homes and from there to inquire into the notion of domestic safety. It will be like a way to interconnect, uh, to interconnect our safety nets, I imagine. People recruiting the agency of the familiarity of their own four walls, if existing, to engage with difficult knowledge. These are testimonies of women from 40 years ago, I remind myself. Probably not as different from what transpires in the courtroom nowadays. Is a comparison in place? How have these become relevant to the present? I feel certain discomfort discomfort handling these old yet what I assume to be recurring stories. 
Should we get all get in the, into courtrooms at the moment, at least once, to bear witness to trial? In her book, The Archival Turn in Feminism, Kate Eichhorn defines archival proximity as the uncanny ability to occupy different temporalities and to occupy temporalities differently, thereby collapsing the rigidly defined generational and historical logics. In the archive story, what matters most is not that the archive creates a real or fully realized dialogue across generation, but rather the that the archive produces a space to imagine an encounter that otherwise may have remained unimaginable. So yes, the archive creates a fictional nearness where unlikely encounters may happen. The observation of the trials illustrate the entrails of the courtroom, the brutal procedure of making justice, not in the antiseptic manner we assume it happens like in the movies, but in an, acoustic, in, a, in an acoustic chaos. Many of the reports tell how it is difficult to hear one's own voice, difficult to voice one's own feeling in the presence, in the presence of st strangers, difficult to overcome language barriers. The hearing is taking place in the terminal of the temporarily apprehended. It is dirty, crowded and hot. The court was full of soldiers from, border, from the border control. People come and go. The judge calls us to come to the stand. She's examining the paper hastily without even addressing the woman. She decided both the husband and the wife must appear in court on Sunday. I tried to explain to the judge it was dangerous and even pointed at a bruise on her face. So she agreed to set the date earlier. The invitation to court should be given by, to the husband by his wife herself, so he could sign it personally. The woman felt uncomfortable doing so, but there was no other choice. She whispers and asks, how does one, how could one speak about personal matters in such a crowded environment? How do you voice the archive when the protagonist herself doesn't even want to be heard in public? Yeah, this is this. Thank you, Ofri. I think it was a very um, um, immersive uh, experience. I like how you started with the architecture and that uh, experience of entering the archive. And I actually had a very similar um, feeling when I just entered the building because it really is hiding kind of um, at the back of, um, of, um, of a residential building and it didn't look like a formal archive. And I think this, its informality uh, is also one of the things that uh, kind of um, 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 is an important aspect of, of the entire process and reflects how this um, process of archiving is becoming a very strong activist um, practice. So um, let's, um, let's um, hear Jessica now, because I think her input will be, um, you know, input of an insider. So um, I'm looking forward to, to hear more also about um, some structural um, challenges and changes that the archive has been uh, creating uh, over the years that it's been active. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm very moved and excited about this uh, invitation and to have my Haifa colleagues here with us, uh, Hannah Safran and Dalia Zaks now in New York and Orna Marias and Sarit Shani, I don't know if you listen to us. Um, I, uh, Ofri, I wanted to tell you that uh, Sarit, she was the first, she, she wrote the first report on the court observations project. So maybe you, I, you can also connect later. And I think this is uh, a very special uh, week to, to talk 
uh, about the Isha Isha because maybe you know, um, I think it's a week ago or a little more, um, Marsha Friedman, that she was the first feminist member of the parliament from 74. Uh, she died, she passed away in the US uh, at uh, 83 years old. And uh, we have been all uh, as a community connected about this. And, you know, I left uh, living in Haifa in 1994, but this is still my, my intimate community of uh, women and sisters. And um, this is an, a very special timing to talk when we all uh, think about uh, Marsha Friedman. Um, I just uh, named her book in case the people in the audience uh, want to um, want to read more. It's uh, a strange in the promised land. No, not a strange. Hannah, no, I can listen to you. Okay, I will write it. Hannah, you can write in the chat. Um, not a strange. Okay, so anyway, um, Marsha Friedman was one of the, our founding mothers in the 70s of the Haifa feminist movement. And it's like 10, 10 years before Isha Leisha was, uh, was founded. And we have now Hannah is the uh, exiled, sorry, exiled in the promised land. Um, and I think I will mention maybe three uh, moments, important moments for me, uh, connected to the her story of uh, the Haifa community, and it connects to the presentation by Ofri. In 1988, uh, a, a girl was uh, gunned raped in a kibbutz, in a school of a kibbutz. And, you know, it was not the first and it was not the last. But it was um, at a point in 1998 that we already started a little bit more to talk. There were three rape crisis centers. And at the beginning, um, the social reaction, the collective reaction of a kibbutz as a close community was to, to silence to silence what happened to her. It was completely a secret. Um, no one talked about that. And it was one uh, a colleague, uh, a, a man from the kibbutz that he called in a way secretly to the Haifa Rape Crisis Center that I was uh, managing there. And he told us what is going on and that everything is a chaos and there's of course blaming she was a 14 years old girl blaming her the the boys were uh, you know uh, protected and he said you have to do something in a way to try to offer a lecture a workshop in the school of the kibbutz and in a way, this is what we did. Uh, and it was, everything was secret, completely silent, silent, silence, like taboo, over taboo. And um, at some point it was out in the media and, and there was a, it was a trial um, to the boys. I think there were, I don't know, eight or 10 boys that raped her. And there were, I think, I think the, the project of the observations of the court in a way non-formally started with this, uh, with this um, rape and with this situation. And we just were there uh, supporting uh, and demonstrating in the street before the court. And uh, the, the, this trial arrived to the Supreme Court. It was a, it was a big, 
discussion and you know the verdict was uh, clever at that point that what society was able to to um to um internalize the verdict in the supreme court the one of the judges say uh it's not when there is a popular song in Hebrew. When you say no, you know, what do you mean? And the judge, hey, when you say yes, you know, the story is that what, what you say yes, what, what it doesn't mean that it's not only when you say yes, this is consent. You know, that was all this discussion on consent. And that was the uh, one of the turning points of talking about blaming the victims. And, you know, well, we have so many lectures that we gave after this case. I travel all along all the uh, police stations in the north talking to policemen and to social workers and to judges and, you know, when I think about feminists, how we are spending so much energy and time and money and resources, all, all people that and foundations that support us. And, you know, from my perspective, I joined the feminist movement in 1984 in Tel Aviv. It's now 35 years. You know, so, so many. Um, uh, energy and resources to change the system, to make the system more sensitive. Because what we do, we train and we train and we work with educators and kindergarten teachers, and which I just say, how you have to be sensitive and how is that judges talk this way and what we do, you know? And there is always this tension inside feminism of changing the system as it is, or challenging and making an alternative. And I want to connect this also with the tribunal, the project I'm involved, and with the, the general two uh, trends into feminism, the liberal feminism in a way to change, sometimes it's cosmetic, or the radical feminism that you challenge the way it is and you say, okay, but let's do it different. And I think connecting to the, to the archives and to the feminist um, uh, institute in Ishaliksha, I think it's, it's uh, an expression of radical feminism in a way that we not only um, uh, protest or criticize or challenge the way archives are constructed or how knowledge is constructed because you know it's a never ending task and you can't go to all national libraries and try to say okay but what you present is just the official history and the official history of Israel, official history of women but we present the diversities of stories of different hair stories of Palestinian women and migrant women and women without status as citizen status as they're called in Israel. And, um, and I, I think the archive it's, and the, the feminist institutes is a way to show, okay, we do it differently. And I want to mention a second uh, historic moment for me that it connects to Isha Lisha. In 1991, uh, it was the Gulf, the Gulf War. Um, when in August 1990, that uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and in January uh, 1991, um, Iraq started sending missiles to Israel. And, you know, and it's very much uh, now with the quarantine of the COVID 19, we have this feeling of, you know, being at home, close all the children together and men and women all together in the house. It was this feeling of 
we have in 1991 in the Gulf War. Uh, you know, Israeli men didn't go to the army because Israel didn't participate, didn't go to the reserve. And generally when there is a war, Israeli men are conditioned to go to the army and feel, okay, let's do it and heroes and women and children stay at home. And in this situation, it was this, okay, all these men and women and children together. And it was six weeks that more or less we were at home. There were no offices, no universities. And six women were killed by their husbands and partners in this period. And, you know, it was not new, but we were all, we were so concentrated on what was, what was going on. I think we didn't use yet the, the, we didn't learn the word femicide from our uh, English speaking sisters. It was just, just the beginning of it. And, and it was, you know, it was the average of one woman killed in a, a week. And at that point, we, we started just to, you know, to collect from the newspaper. There was no internet from the newspaper to collect, to cut all the items covering about these women who were killed by their husbands. I remember there was an Ethiopian woman, a Russian speaking woman, a Palestinian woman. Um, and uh, we say, okay, let's, let's see. I remember the moment that we say, Let's see what happened a year before. Maybe it's not rare that in an average, one woman is killed by their close uh, partners uh, in a week. And so what you do, you go to the computer, to the statistic, or what you suppose that the police, the, the police, uh, the, uh, the police authorities are doing. And we discovered that there was no possibility to analyze the, the data because there was no way, and I think it's still until now, that you can't go to the police statistic and see who is the man kill the woman. Because you can see maybe there were, I don't know, 90 women killed, but you don't know what is their relationship because there was no visibility to talk about femicide, to see that women are killed because they are women. And, at some point, it was, I think, the first that we challenged the, the policymakers to try to see, okay, if we don't see, if everything is invisible, we can't analyze, we can't change, and maybe we can't give budget to more, I don't know, shelters. And we did this kind of detective work, and we more or less we discovered, we reconstructed what happened in a year before. And it was more or less the, the you know, seven, eight women that were killed before. So it was that, okay, this, it was this visibility. And from that point we have in, in, and in one of the um, uh, publishing for this event, you can see the folders, you know, the old black folders uh, of Office of Shali Shah from 1991 that we have the, the items from the newspaper. And in the last uh, years, I met uh, many families of women who were killed by femicide. I, and some of them, they, you know, it was from the period before the internet, they don't have these items. And I invite them to Ishali Isha to see, you know, to, to this moment of history that they have. And, and from this um, thinking about alternatives and criticizing the criminal court and all this uh, despair and this frustration of educating, educating all these men and women. Uh, it was, you know, in the last 20 years, I have been researching independently uh, alternative models of justice. And uh, Maria, you, you mentioned um, when you introduced me the issue of transitional justice. And I have been trying in the last 20 years when I discover these models, including transitional justice, uh, that it's, uh, you know, I, I was born in Argentina and in South America, in many countries, and especially in Argentina, we suffered 
dictatorship and mass violations of human rights in the in the 80s uh, influenced by US policies and Argentina was the first uh, uh, example of history of trying to heal how what you do when you can't go to court you can't put on trial so many bad people because there were so many perpetrators when you can't do that you try to do another way to took your society and make a transition like later happening in south africa that you also when there is a pandemic of perpetrators you can put them on trial but also because you don't know where they are also they you know escape when uh, the, the apartheid is finished or the dictatorship is finished. So this, this alternative mechanisms like truth commissions, it was when they were born. And in Argentina, it was the first time it was not yet called a truth commission because you know sometimes you do things and later you have the words for that. And the transitional justice was born there, but it, it was not the word and Argentina made the first steps that uh, gave a lesson to the world what you do, not in the criminal system, in the alternative spaces that to make justice, what, how you ask victims which kind of justice you want. And around the year 2000, the discipline of transitional justice was born in the world. And people put together all this knowledge that has been going on, including South Africa, that it was yes called a truth commission, you know, a way to a, space, a safe space, an alternative court, when you put all these perpetrators and witnesses and you say, how we do remedies, how we demand acknowledgement. And the moment I was exposed to these models and related to my, my homeland, to Argentina, I tried to put all this together and say how we build this kind of truth commissions of people's court for gender violence. Because in gender violence also you can't put all perpetrators on trial because the law doesn't allow you because there are all these barriers of statute of limitation that for that reason, I imagine also in your countries, but also here, most of the uh, situations when we are able to talk about what happened to us related to gender crimes, the statute of limitation say, okay, too old, okay, you, you can't talk about that. Or we present a complaint and it's closed because lack of public interest. This is one of the reasons that our complaints, our suffering are, are named. And um, so in from all this thinking and all this cooking, uh, three years ago, I gathered a group of colleagues and we established the Tribunal for Gender Crimes. That it's, it comes from this idea of of course, we have to continue educating policymakers, and we have to continue giving lecture to police station staff about how they have to talk about victims. It doesn't help so much. You know, I can give you examples of every week. And but the examples that we have are the examples of the uh, tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of women that arrive to the police station or to the police statistic. The whole, you know, the invisible majority, it's all of us, most of us, we didn't never, we presented a complaint because it's, there is this gap between our experiences and what the law and the criminal system expect from us to say. And this blaming of the victim culture that it's all pandemic. So we open an alternative uh, platform and we invite women to say, this is your alternative court. This is your people's court. And you can tell your story in your own terms. And together we build uh, how is it look. 
and uh, we have kind of you want a panel with alternative judges you want to do it publicly the event the launching the official launching of the event it was in last december in the middle of the COVID, and hannah uh, safran was uh, one of our alternative judges we have this panel of one you know, he would try to challenge the fragmentation of discourses. In general, there is the therapeutic discourse, there is the legal discourse, there is the political discourse, and everything is fragmented and disconnected. So we say we have this panel with an, one mental health worker and one and one a woman working in the criminal system and Hannah Safran as a feminist as an historian and two women presented their suit with their complaints their alternative complaints to an alternative community and we build the tribunal because we don't wait we say we feel responsible for all the women who didn't receive justice so we have this and we have the system and this event was we were because of the COVID-19 we were 20 women in the physical space and it was live um, broadcast in Facebook and more than 5,000 women and men were watching you know this big community of people and two women presented there were these alternative judges giving a, you know giving a resonance giving acknowledgement saying we are here and we listen to you and we have now many many women who each of them are in a way tailoring their special way and we always uh, communicate the system the ministry of uh, health the ministry, the police that we are doing this always we invite them we say okay we have a woman she presented an alternative complaint and she said she has these complaints about you and sometimes we receive an answers and we read we hope in uh, in a few years we will have them answering because we you know we take the agency the responsibility that to call them we are not all only the witnesses that we are called you know something happened to us and we are called the witness in the tribunal we are called we are presenting the complaints and we call the police to react and to give an answer to to what uh, to what happened and um, okay i have much more connections but i think i will stop now yeah jessica thank you so much it's um so interesting to know some insights and some turns within the uh within the um, um long history uh very long history of um of the of the archive and uh so like why it's uh, was really important for us to connect with you within the under umbrella of uh, our exhibition is just to um uh to sort of um um uh, nail down certain solidarity with uh, different cases and geographical cases uh of uh activities that are voicing cases uh, voicing um situations and um uh of violence and uh, uh social injustice uh, human injustice and uh not just voicing, but indexing that, uh, filing it, archiving it, which is becoming a part of social history. So such cases impossible to unlearn anymore once they package in the, in the archive and, um, uh, and impossible to deny because it's there, it um, uh, has its uh, file, so it's filed like uh, like you create your own legal system in a way which goes uh, which uh, I guess uh, um, <clears throat> build somehow in existing uh, legal uh, legal rules, but you sort of uh, make the alternative way of um, uh, understanding these legal rules and uh, uh, performing them or executing them as well. So thank you so much for 
for for doing that and um it's uh, it's an impressive work and it's especially impressive that it is based on certain deep understanding of necessity of that within community because it's passing from one generation to another so which makes this work as even more valuable yeah um, I have a comment and a question maybe to Hannah also, because I would like to also include her in the conversation. Um, um, for me, um, it was very also important to learn, um, uh, I think, about um, eff like direct effect of your work. Um, because uh, I think everything that you're doing is, you know, slowly is penetrating the legal system. These processes are always taking a lot of time, but they're extremely important. So when this critical mass is being accumulated, it makes certain changes. So I would maybe ask you to very briefly touch upon the um, um, uh, law against trafficking that the Hype Archive Institute was so involved into promoting and, and how you were kind of developing your agenda in um, actually making certain changes on legal legal levels in Israel. Yeah, once we discovered that women were trafficked to Israel from the um, ex-USSR countries like Moldavia, the Ukraine, other parts in Eastern Europe, and we started to look for them and to ask them what their needs were and uh, how we can uh, change the legal system. Because in the legal system at that time, um, in the two, early 2000s, the end of the 90s, there was no law against trafficking um, because as far as the country was concerned, until that time, there was no trafficking. Uh, so um, it was very important to get the uh, women to, to speak. And I think this is what the archive really does uh, historically and at the present. If you find actually the women uh, who can tell their story and then together we can make it into a change, a legal change. So eventually, yes, after hard work and joining with other uh, organization and members of parliament, we were uh, able to, um, to effect a change of, in the law and women um, uh, were not uh, the victims of the criminal uh, justice because, uh, um, because until then uh, they were the one taken to prison because they were illegally in the country. Uh, once the law was changed, the uh, traffickers were uh, taken to court and eventually some of them were persecuted. So the whole history of this project is also now in the archive. So uh, it's, uh, as you said before, um, it's very important to keep building on what had happened. So you can present your history of uh, full of cases to support uh, your demands. So sometimes it really helps us and sometimes it really fills us with sort of sadness that here we have all these documents and we cannot really and make an impact now, here and now, because uh, it takes time and it takes uh, lots of work. And the example of the tribunal is, uh, is how things are not necessarily connected one to one, but they have a ongoing uh, ripple effect and slowly a change happen. Definitely there is a change. The society in the 70s is not, is not what we witness now. The discourse is different. Women are much more brave in coming out and saying uh, outright what had happened to them. There is a international understanding that uh, uh, women are human beings. So of course it changes from one place to another. And uh, uh, documenting the history is, is very important. Uh, and as uh, Ofri found out, it's also material for art, which is so important in our lives. So all together we can uh, use what we have to create uh, culture and uh, change and activism. 
So it really is uh, wonderful. And thank you all for doing this. This is so exciting. I hope it, yeah. the recording uh, gets uh, everywhere. Yeah, that's definitely, I think art has the potential actually art being kind of this uh, place of imagination and a proposition in a way for the society, I think it has a potential of bringing into public discourse this um, uh, unknown, hidden, uh, forgotten, uh, um, neglected knowledge uh, about uh, social injustice. And uh, I think that, um, but also demonstrate right uh, the um, uh, those uh, uh, insufficient uh, holes uh, in uh, gaps in a way in legislative system which allows this injustice to happen exactly. and I think what Ofri is uh, is trying to do although of course in a very gentle way because it is a gentle it's a it's a very sensitive material to deal with stories of people that don't want to be heard even publicly like how would you abstract yourself from this very documentary very real uh traumas and uh put it in a in a wider stage right so that's somehow like uh Ofri, what is uh, your so far what is your um, thoughts and uh, what is your, um, I don't know, invention of um, um, artistic artistic and research level in, in that direction. So how far you are in this, when we will see some uh, outcomes of your work with the, with the archive, which is very challenging uh, task indeed. Um, yeah, I don't know yet. I mean, it, it is very challenging and it started it started to be like, like it presented to me as challenging. And then I thought, ah, the challenge is actually the interesting part. And that's what I want to thematize in the work. And just this, this all these relationships and what like through this archival proximity is like how it brings people together. And if I do make a reading that is um, been done by more than me, but like more participants. How do we voice the archive, and how do we approach the idea of voicing the these all these like layers of uh, testimonies, observation of testimonies, and so on? It's it become very yeah complex, but in the same time, I feel like it's an interesting question to ask. Um, uh, and to really address this kind of all the tonalities, like the sensitivities and just just by reading through the documents, which I was really hesitant to translate and to read out loud. I thought there was so much, so many spaces, the places of like, that it's just the people who come in into the court and observing and they want to make justice and just like little moments of fragilities. And I think I thought that these were very, interesting to me um, just the, the manner of expression and I think this this is like a path to go I, I don't know yet how when it will take place but I'm working on it yeah and I hope to include to follow it because it's really like uh, all, all the documents and to follow it into like uh, talk with the observants the people who are in the courtrooms, maybe follow the stories of the people and what happens to them and so on. Like, so this is uh, to create like continu continu continuities. Yeah. And I remember when Ofra and I we were discussing, you know, how, how to voice the archive, we I think we're also facing this dilemma of how can you uh, present an archive in an exhibition space or artistic realm without sort of um, reproducing this very um, hostile discourse that is present in courtrooms that is yeah. sometimes you know and we talked about it also today that women who are in court how they they face this language barriers and they face all these stereotypes and they they feel very weak and they feel being a victim during the entire process of, of this hearing and um, they have to kind of repeat a very traumatic story over and over again. So how do we kind of um, 
voice her story without hurting for more. And I think it's also a very um, important kind of ethical dilemma, which um, is important to kind of, you know, address from different positions when we um, uh, want to voice certain stories, but one don't want to kind of hurt people who are um, inside of the stories. So that's something also to keep in mind, I think. Yeah, there is one question uh, or comment uh, really about uh, in the chat uh, that um, a feminist and gender discourse uh, based um, on uh, discrimi uh, discrimination and violence in some countries and cultures are often uh, uh, active only among um, academic and elitist or artist field. And I guess this question to Jessica, do you feel, or maybe like uh, all participants of the, uh, of the archive, do you feel the work of the tribunal and the uh, archive brings this discourse and acknowledgement of gender crimes into the broader public discourse? Or is it more isolated to the people you work with, people coming to the court and uh, with legal legislative realm? <laughs> May I answer? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. You know, I see it from this uh, perspective of the the seventies. You know, the beginning of the feminist movement in Israel, and I mentioned uh, uh, Marsha Friedman, and she, together with other colleagues, she was one of the founders of the first shelter uh, for battered women. You know, we don't use so much this expression now, but that was the expression battered women and was in Haifa, as many good things that started in Haifa. And uh, it, you know, it was this kind of uh, revolutionary idea that it, it was clear that the, who, who is supposed to take care of battered women? I don't know, the welfare, okay? But it was not this completely, not understanding and blaming the victim perspective. And it was necessary not to train social workers at that point. It was emergency. It was, you have to make an alternative space, a safe space to save the women. So that's the way the shelter was created. And when you think about all these um, alternative spaces that were created. Then, you know, the shelters and the first rape crisis center was created in uh, Tel Aviv. And if I remember well, in uh, 1981, and it was uh, as a result of a woman that she, she killed herself and she left a letter. And she, then she said that she was raped in their family. They didn't know. And she say, after the rape, I had to pass a second and third rape in the police station and in the court. And then it was, you know, this reaction of, we can't trust, we can't count on the system and we have to create an alternative site, the rape crisis center. And from, from the 70s and the 80s, so many alternative and in the world, so alternative spaces in health, you know, in, in, in now in economic violence, we have in Israel so many NGOs, so many organizations because the, the mainstream system is not giving an answer. So I think that uh, from that point of being completely in the margins, you know, to create the first budget women shelter. That is also, now the, the Ministry of Welfare, there is a, a division inside that is in charge of the shelters and they give more or less 50% of the budget and they have uh, supervisors and inspectors and they are in charge and it's in a way, you know, there is also this co-optation system of how, you know, the mainstream uh, in a way takes what it was radical. And now the rape crisis centers, of course, are less and less and less radical every day. And I think this situation of, uh, of the therapy discourse 
now I think with the tribunal, we are touching like another step of doing this, this uh, challenging this with the legal system. And I think, let's say, I don't know, 10 years, I know I optimistic, it, it won't be, it will be less margin. It will be some of what we do, it will go into the mainstream. And I will give you an example, you know, as every day something happened, there is this uh, woman, she's in charge of all the issue of gender violence in the Ministry of Welfare. And I knew her name, she didn't know me. And I saw her in a committee of the Knesset, of the parliament, and I just approached her. And I told her, hi, my name is Jessica Nevo. I am from the tribunal. And she said, oh, I read an article. She, she knew what was it, okay? It was, wow, okay, she gave me her card. We have Zoom and she offered me you know, she understood what is the tribunal about the alternative judges. And she told me, when you do the next ones, we would like from the Ministry of Welfare to be part and respond, to be part of the process and be there to give legitimacy of the process you do that is completely, you know, we don't have any mandate. And we always say it's, you know, this is a civil initiative we do it out of a moral and civil responsibility. And we, you know, we, we, we can't give orders to anyone. And, and she, you know, she wanted th that to, to, we participate them and to be part of it. And in, in the first uh, public hearing, in the first uh, people's court we did with Ishalik Shah, it was just before COVID. It was in uh, December 2019, December 10, the International Human Rights Day. And we did for women without uh, citizen status. And one of the alternative uh, judges, she, she is um, a judge, how you say, emeritus judge, you know, and she is uh, a a known judge, Sabiona Rotlevi, and she deals with women and with children, and she's out of the system now. And I asked her if she would like to play, you know, to be in a situation of to perform an alternative. And she was part. And for the women who were there, her presence, it was very important because this is this dialogue. So I believe, I believe it it will happen as it happened with the Rape Crisis Center as the shelters. Yeah, and, but of course for that the state should be ready and willing to, to help its citizens and reconsider its own social institutes, institutions. And um, not every government is ready or willing to do that. And for instance, Russian case when, um, you know, um, the, the domestic violence was decriminalized, I think, 2013 or something. And there's still a lot of struggle going on on the part of um, kind of independency policymaker and the lawyers to, to bring this law back. And there is a group of very courageous women who are, um, you know, trying very hard to, um, uh, to, to push kind of this new legislation to bring it back, but they haven't been very successful so far because the state is not, I think, interested in... in um, um, the state has interests that are opposing interests of, of the citizens and that um, these cases we see more and more often and also in Turkey, as we were mentioning before, in other countries when we see again that the, um, the value of, of a human life is again um, diminishing and very often this, this human life is a life of a woman. So there's uh, still um, um, lots of work needs to be done, but um, I just wanted to, to thank you again for, for the work that you were doing. And I think this example of this very grassroots, uh, not attempt, but process of alternative justice is, is um, a great example for all of us that change is possible. And um, you just need to be very persistent um, and um, attentive to lots of details. And um, thank you for your work. And thank you for joining us today and talking about it.
Yeah, and um, um, so like event today is just our humble input into uh, into your work and just a possibility to bring her uh, to drag you a little bit on the on the in the field of art and to demonstrate your example uh, to also tell bigger uh, bigger uh, wider audience uh, maybe people in art field about existence of such archive like yours and uh, maybe invite to people to work with this look at it and uh, also think uh, about the importance of um, uh, uh, working with social history and uh, also make it a uh, uh, part of official history as well because that's uh, uh, that's be, as we know official history showing on the glory side of societal life and uh, not uh, mistakes of uh, legis law and, and government. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Apex Art, for uh, hosting us uh, today, putting the event and all the uh, participants. And I see like it's a, like a, like a uh, very strong fan group uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the, among participants today came to see uh, Jessica to support her and uh, Jessica and Ofri and uh, yeah. And uh, Ofri, thank you so much also for introducing us to, uh, I mean, first Marsha and then us uh, talk with the work of, um, of the archive. I hope we'll continue being in touch and uh, maybe collaborate one day. For Thank sure. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been such a really impactful and important conversation. And it's so good to learn this history. Um, in the chat, there are the links to the exhibition, Voicing the Silence. There is a really thorough um, 3D tour that you can take of, of, of the works there. Um, it closed on the 19th of September. So this is the way that it lives on, on our website. Um, there's also links to the, um, the brochure with a really wonderful Wonderful essay by the top curators so you can read that either in English or in Russian um, so those links are also in the chat if you don't get a chance to click on them now you can always go to our website apexart.org and in the past exhibitions as the exhibition just closed you will find voicing the silence so I encourage you to explore that more um, please also follow um, apex art on our different forms of media. You can follow us on Facebook and, and um, Instagram and on Eventbrite and uh, sign up for our mailing list. And some of those links are in the chat as well. Maybe Lisa, maybe we can just drop those in real fast um, before we close up. And thank you to the Apex Art team and to the top curators and to our incredible speakers today. And um, I, I wish you all a wonderful evening or morning or day or wherever you are in the world today. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank okay. you. Bye, Bye guys. Thanks a lot again. Thank you.